I have what you might call a peculiar approach to the Bible and to Christianity. I suppose I have a certain blind will to follow the words of Christ alone, though I'm uncertain of my reasons and unable to justify my belief, perhaps even wanting to leave it behind. I'm at a point in my life now where I'm trying to decide what is the most important to my faith. I've seen so much condemnation from Christianity. Jesus wouldn't want this. But what love is there? Thus a part of me, or perhaps parts, scream for my release of this belief. It is a stigma which I do not willingly associate myself with. Though, on the other hand, to walk away now would be to burn my own heart to ash, and I would be a hypocrite, construed immediately as self-righteous and unloving and unchristlike. Soren Kierkegaard comes to mind here. He says, Since my earliest childhood, a barb of sorrow has lodged in my heart. As long as it stays, I am ironic, but if it's pulled out, I will die. Yet I'm not comforted, and instead I'm confronted. It takes no effort for me to imagine this uncertainty as my barb of sorrow. My faith in God feels shallow. It's unjustified, it deconstructs. What pitiful defense of God I can mount deconstructs? The very attributes of what we call God deconstruct. We can never define God, else it's not God. And try as we might, the most defensible stance we could take is to say that God is omnipotent and omniscient. But just by the nature of our humanity, we cannot know the implications of even those words. We should be content. But I'm not. For I at least, have an inherent desire to know God. And as I'm sure you're well aware, Christian apologetics will fail me. You say that it's dead. Yet, I attempt anyway, bound by the same paradoxical imperfections that have plagued our existence since as far back as we can remember. Why do I do it? Well, try. Why do I persist? Am I crazy? Am I stupid? Am I obsessed? Of course I am. Kierkegaard would agree with me here, too. He says that any attempt to rationalize and defend Christianity, even with the best of intentions, is equal to Judas betraying Christ with a kiss. Of course it's stupid, and I still agree, though I recognize and appreciate the absurdity in what I try to do. You are an absurdist, so you would understand where I'm coming from here. It is as Camus said, it is the most harrowing passion of all, simultaneously imprisoning and liberating. You and I both know that to walk away from this would be to burn the heart I simultaneously exalt. It makes perfect sense. Of course I'm obsessed and passionate, imprisoned by this insatiable desire to really know and understand God. Perhaps it's just as well that Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I can't help but notice the Sisyphean implications of that statement. So this is my existence, however pitiful it may be. I consider myself to be a Christian existentialist, which immediately puts me in a very awkward position with modern organized religion. After all, existentialism is a philosophy of subjectivity. Christianity is viewed by almost everyone as an asinine attempt at objective truth. I think this is why it comes off as offensive by the mere mention of it. We say, I know God exists. I've accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. But if you don't, you're going to go to hell. God has no tolerance for sin. We find, just by holding on so tightly to this strict belief, that by extension we condemn the very people we are trying to enlighten. We unintentionally hold Christ above the heads of others, basically saying, I have what you don't have, and you need it, or else. I don't believe that this is the right approach to Christianity. In fact, I downright loathe it. I'm talking to Christians and theists in general here. But if I'm capable of grasping God objectively, it's not belief, it's not faith. Not only that, but Jesus almost never taught this approach. In fact, the way Jesus taught encouraged finding a subjective and personal truth of a subjective and personal God. In his parables, you'll see that he never explicitly tells you the meaning of what he is saying. 
He says what he says, and he leaves it up to you to decipher it. Relate it to yourself. I think this point was missed in Christianity, and because it was misinterpreted, we have created the stigma of our faith that I spoke of earlier. We have painted a contradictory picture of ourselves. How can we be loving and condemning at the same time? And some of us don't even see that we do it. We have our facts, and we usually do present them with as much love, compassion, and empathy as we can. Yet, by the very fact that we take it objectively, the implied condemnations hold so much more weight that we've unknowingly shot ourselves in the foot. We've effectively distorted everyone's view of our motives. Who could possibly see humility in someone who is claiming to know a truth that requires a choice of acceptance, especially when the choice has such condemning consequences for making the wrong one? Instead of witnessing to and with people, we end up preaching at them. We don't listen, we talk. We talk about the Bible as if it's the end-all, be-all of truth and knowledge, and then we wonder why people get so upset and offended at us sharing this belief out of genuine love. Humility and unconditional love are the most important qualities a Christian should have, and we inadvertently destroy them. It's no wonder Nietzsche says God is dead. We've killed what was most precious to us, and the incriminating blood is a stain which we can never wipe away. In our attempt to present a belief in God, we have to put ourselves on an equal pedestal just to appear worthy enough to do this. By trying to claim with absolute certainty that our belief in Christ is true, and no others are, we destroy everything that Christ stood for. We box God up and take it with us, and it becomes a weapon to others. Yeah, it may be true, but we're so afraid that if we present this idea with this, as a subjective truth, it loses its meaning. We fear the idea that we may be wrong. Strange, isn't it? We have to take responsibility for our beliefs. We have to take the blame for them. I think that brings us back to Jesus. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his, and take up his cross daily and follow me. Take careful note of the pronoun used. Jesus doesn't say take up a cross or take up my cross. He instead personalizes it, convicts us individually, subjectively. Our cross is subjective. It's a metaphor for absurdity, for humble passion, for submitting to our faith. Yet faith isn't just an abstract, aesthetic emotion, but something far higher. Nor is it an empirical, objective truth, but again, something far higher. It's not a proof, for there is no proof for that which is indescribable. This is why we should take responsibility for our faith, except that it is ours, and that is the only reason we have to believe, personally. And when we take up our crosses, we are guaranteed to get nailed to them every time. Why was this unexpected? Did we not see Christ set the example? While Christ was suffering through the flagellation and crucifixion, not once did he utter a condemnation. He took responsibility. He humbled himself and died because of it. Even through the Pharisees' rally cries of proof. We can't provide proof for our claims, but it's humble to attempt. Irreverent to the Great Commission to not attempt. That's what my cross is, Christian apologetics. Though it may be dead, and though it may be futile, I absurdly attempt to resurrect it. My cross is philosophy. My cross is knowledge, trust, my cross is truth. It is my passion to do so in both senses of the world. Sometimes it makes me more than happy. And sometimes, well not so much, but that's alright.